unapologetic conversations. So, uh, yeah, I don't mind starting with that. Um, shameless plug. So in my book, I actually have a chapter on creating opportunities for evangelism. Uh, uh, and, and because I think it's a fair question. One of the things I, I stress in there is a lot we didn't touch on. I, I know Adam touched on some of this, so did some of the other guys. But you have worldviews within our culture, what the Bible calls strongholds. Before you can even learn and know how to respond to a stronghold, you have to be able to identify it. You have to have the eyes to see it. And what I think has gone on is that a lot of people, churches, Christians, they don't know how to identify them. And in their mind, evangelism is just sharing my personal testimony. So it's as if they're waiting for the conversation to pause so I can just share what God has done in my life and then hope that you like it enough to become a Christian. But the problem with that is it's unnatural. It kind of it's sometimes weird, awkward. But as a quick example um, that I give in the book is, you know, one time this started as a joke for me because um, I was joking with someone. They said, can I pick your brain? And I said, why would you want to do that? Because my brain's just matter and fluid. How about you pick my mind? And they looked really confused uh, because they, they kind of didn't get the joke. It was a bad attempt at a joke. And, and basically what I'm alluding to is the fact that we are an immaterial soul with a mind that's also immaterial. My brain doesn't think. My mind thinks. Nevertheless, they're like, well, I just need to ask you some questions. And, and like, but what do you mean by that? And within about five minutes, that entire conversation turned into an evangelistic conversation on how we are made in God's image, how we relate to him, and why we need him. Now, I started that as a joke because what she said alluded to a reductionistic mentality. Whether she realized it or not, I was able to pick up on some of the things she was saying that had philosophical theological implications and by having the eyes to see these things in conversation I'm able to direct the conversation in a certain way that has a relevance to evangelism theology God's existence and how we relate to him all of that uh, look for look for what makes something tick uh, find out what's important to a person if you're looking for an opportunity to share the gospel or get into a uh, apologetics conversations with people find out what that person is passionate about so uh, I told you guys in, in my talk I like to do three gun competitions so everybody at these competitions is all Second Amendment folks you know but most of these guys aren't walking with Jesus either and uh, so you know I'll start talking to them about the Second Amendment I'm like uh, so what makes that an unalienable right that ought not be violated by anybody including governments and ultimately, I'm getting to, well, it's got to be God. And hey, by the way, that's what was talked about in the Declaration of Independence, that we get our rights from our Creator, and that gets us into a conversation on objective morality and everything else. So just look for opportunities. I've even done this with folks in the LGBTQ uh, <laughs> arena, right? They start talking about gay rights. And I said, well, what is a gay right? Uh, is that, are you talking about human rights? Well, where do human rights come from? And I start getting them to God. I say, oh, well, wait, wait. If these gay rights exist, then God exists. And by the way, if God exists, then the homosexual lifestyle is objectively wrong. You know? so, but, but you just look for opportunities. What makes a person tick? What are they excited about? What do they want to talk about? And uh, I think if you're looking for those, you can find them. Yeah, I would just say real briefly, too, um, be genuinely interested in people. right? When you think about substantive conversations, they typically come about within the context of a relationship. You know, when you're genuinely out here trying to love people and come alongside them, then you find yourself in position for, for them to lob those hard questions at you. They give you an opportunity to then, you know, get, go into the, the, the things that you guys were talking about. But um, you might be the person who's called to be like the evangelist who's on the street corner with the soapbox. And, you know, there's, there's nothing wrong with that at all. But I would encourage people not to overlook the opportunities that you have in the course of the relationships that you're developing with people as you're just loving all folks. Question over here. Uh, this uh, question is for Michael specifically, but feel free, um, everybody else, to answer. Oh, it's not going to turn the mic up towards you. Yeah. There we go. Um, this is specifically for Michael, but everybody else, you know, feel free to chip in as it applies. Um, since so much of the conversation uh, in society these days is online, is social media, these kind of things, um, I know that uh, I follow your YouTube channel, and you have stuff that's really um, 
long form, well represented, uh, well produced, uh, longer videos, and you also have small, quick content and everything in between. Uh, could you talk to how you pick those battles, how you uh, decide what's uh, what to focus on, what to spend time on, what's worth uh, taking that time and effort to do, because there's such a, a widening range of things out there. Yeah, that's a, a difficult question, because I think it takes experience just being in that field, knowing when to pick your battles. And we all have battles, we got to know when to pick them. Like, sometimes I'll see a new atheist or an anti-theist just ranting in my comment section, I'm going to let that go. You know, I, He's trying to pull me down to his level, he waste my time, uh, ignore that. In terms of picking videos, I look for where there are needs. So if you look at a lot of the apologetics community, uh, I saw there's a lot of great apologetics doing New Testament stuff. But a couple years ago, I realized there was no one doing Old Testament stuff. So... I've been doing a lot of series on, like, I did a whole series on evidence for the Exodus, called Exodus Rediscovered. I did a series debunking the documentary hypothesis. I'm planning to do a series arguing that the Pentateuch, the five books of Moses, date back to the time of Moses. No one's doing that, and so I saw a need. So I heard this one time. It's two things. Look at where there's a need, and what are your passions. Where those two meet is where God is calling you to act. So... Focus in on that. I noticed, you mentioned the short-form stuff, there weren't a lot of apologists on TikTok a year and a half ago, so I unfortunately got on there, got my hazmat suit on, got, got into that, and man, it is, it is a dumpster dive, I'll tell you that. But there are people on there who need to hear the gospel, so we're supposed to go to everywhere to spread the gospel, and I'm, I've seen some other apologists, not up here, but I've seen some going, I'm not going on TikTok, I'm too good for that. No, you're not, because Jesus, who was on his throne was not too good to come down and save us when we were his enemies. So look at where there's a need. What are your passions? Go. If you're just some guy that has a Facebook account or a Twitter account, that might be what you're called to do. Sometimes I miss being just a small guy that could just have conversations with people online. Look at who, read their comments, look at who you think might be open, who's asking questions, and try to start a reasonable conversation with them. Be polite. Ask them questions. Don't just preach to them, as Eric was saying earlier. Ask questions. Get them to think about this type of stuff. But again, need, passion, find where it is, go for it. All right. That answers the question. Next question over here. So I know we were talking about like free will, free thinking today. Um, and I was just wondering, because there's some Christians that kind of believe in compatibilism, like a Christian sort of compatibilistic free will, um, mostly Calvinists. But, you know, the idea that basically, yeah, you're free, but you're free and your heart just desires sin, so you're only going to choose sin. And then if you're, for example, specifically, my dad seems to think verses like um, 1 Corinthians 10.13, or I think Romans 12.2, those just apply to Christians after they've been saved and that then you kind of get a sort of true free will. Um, is there any biblical specific verses or principles that would combat that or that would suggest that everyone has free will, regardless if you put your faith in Christ or not? Okay. Dr. Tim Stratt. So, uh, okay, so compatibilism is the thesis that some kind of free will and or moral responsibility is compatible with determinism. So that's what compatibilism means in the, you know, in, the, in the academic sense. Now, people throw out compatibilism all the time and don't know what that means. I think most Christians at the lay level, when they say compatibilism, they, may, they read what Scripture talks about, that God's completely sovereign and uh, they, uh, predestines all things, and that somehow uh, frees, uh, Christians are free and even free to do otherwise. As you met, or Not just Christians, but people, at least sometimes, at least one person, can choose otherwise, and that's a strong sense of free will that we call libertarian freedom. And so I say, well, biblical compatibilism is the idea that God is sovereign over all things, predestines all things, and that humans still have libertarian free will in a strong sense. And that's what I seek to answer in my book and on my uh, YouTube channel and everything like that. I think that's what most people have in mind when they say compatibilism, but the academics have something different in mind, and so we have to always ask, what do you mean by that? Um, you said, you brought up 1 Corinthians 10.13. That's a, a scripture that I like to start with. 
this, you know, it says uh, God always provides a way of escape when we're tempted to sin. It is written to Christians, so we can't just assume that's everybody. But let's just say this. Okay, well, Christians, if we're tempted to sin, we know that God promises to give us a way of escape. Since I still sin, hardly ever. No, just kidding. <laughs> Since I still sin, I know that the last time I sinned, God gave me a way of escape, so I could have done otherwise, and I failed to, and that's why I'm responsible for that sin. Now, that means at least some people, Christians, have this strong sense of libertarian freedom. So that means that exa- what I call exhaustive divine determinism is false. There's at least some people that have this freedom. Um, and now I say, okay, well, did God, was God surprised by that free choice? Uh, did God know how I would freely choose prior to the foundations of the world? I say, yes. Well, that means that God has middle knowledge, and that means that some flavor of Molinism is true. Go check out my book in the back. Um, now, to your other question, I think Deuteronomy, you can appeal to Deuteronomy to make a strong case in Exodus, um, other, other passages in the Old Testament, especially where it shows that uh, um, these unre- the unregenerate Israelites had the power. Moses says, here I set before you life and death blessings and curses. Now choose life. You don't have to die. And then when they're choosing death, he's like, why do you die? You don't have to. Right? So Moses seems pretty clear that he says, you can choose this or choose that, that both of these are compatible. Both these alternatives are compatible with your nature in that specific uh, circumstance of choice, of choosings. And that means that you can choose one way or the other, and that means you've got libertarian freedom. So I do think it applies. Uh, and in my book, I talk about even the unregenerate sinner can choose between robbing the bank or robbing the liquor store. And that's a choice between options, each compatible with the unregenerate nature. Therefore, they've still got libertarian freedom. So there might be some things that an unregenerate person doesn't have access to, but that doesn't mean they don't have libertarian freedom. I could talk about this all day. I better stop. Please don't. You should write a book about that. <laughs> I would like to say one thing about that, Tim. You know that you and I both love this topic and spend a lot of time on this topic. You can do what he just did with a number of Bible passages. The one that I like to go to is the Cain and Abel story in um, Genesis 4, where you have, you know, we all know, maybe we don't all know the story, but Cain and Abel, the sons of Adam and Eve, Cain kills Abel. They're both given, they both bring sacrifices. Abel's sacrifice is acceptable. Cain's isn't. And later, Cain kills Abel. But before he kills Abel, God says to Cain, why is your countenance fallen? If you do well, will you not be accepted? But sin lies at the door. God is strongly implying, if not outright saying, that Cain can do better than what he has done and is about to do. Uh, and, and, And yet, Cain doesn't do that. Now, if God, uh, if determinism is true, such that there, however you want to phrase this, there is no state of affairs in which Cain does better. The fact of the matter is, God is either being, sounds to me, and I say this, I'm trying to say this in a measured way, but God is either being deceptive or outright lying to Cain to intimate that Cain can do better when God knows he has determined that Cain won't do better. Next, Richard. Hey, uh, so take the top ten verses that the atheists say, you know, these are the bad verses. And even Christians like Paul Copan say, these are the top ten that really bother me. What if you were to find out, what if scholars were to find out that those ten verses were added later, they find earlier scripture, or even they find something that says those ten verses were changed, and that the original verse says, don't do these things, and then someone changed it to do these things. Would that affect your Christianity? Anybody could, whoever wants to. So... No, because a lot of times we know the Old Testament actually was updated throughout Israel's prophetic history. So to look at Genesis 14.14. 14. It says, Abraham went into the land of Dan. Okay, we know it was not called the land of Dan because that's Abraham's grandson. Uh, he wasn't called that. Uh, Genesis also talks about them going into the land of Ramesses at the end. and wasn't called Ramesses until much later. So there are those sort of updates. Now, analogy I use is something called the holy stapler analogy. Credit to Michael Heiser for it. So imagine you're a disciple of Isaiah, and one day Isaiah dies. Oh, no, what are we going to do? Everyone, gather his teachings. We've got we to gotta get it all together. Anyone got a stapler? No, you're not going to say that. You're going to go, anyone good at writing? 
We hear all these great teachings from Isaiah. We need to weave this into a coherent book so people understand it. And that's kind of how biblical texts were done in the ancient world. The school of Isaiah would continue on, and they would work with his teachings and add commentary. If you look in the Greek Septuagint, Jeremiah, the book of Jeremiah, it is one-seventh shorter than in what it, what's in your Bible. And what scholars believe is that when Jeremiah was taken into exile, the book, that is, uh, some, one of the s disciples or students of Jeremiah added a little bit of commentary, restructured it for the children of Israel as they were in Babylonian exile. That's why we have the two variations on Jeremiah. That's what was just the accepted aspect. And God can work through people just like he can work through Jeremiah. He says that Israel's prophetic history, he's revealing scripture, he can work through a scribe to help add commentary, to help work and get this out there, just like he can work through prophets as well, deliver the revelations to. So as scripture is being revealed, there are prophets, there are tradents, there are scribes that he's going to be working through to get us the message of scripture. So we should expect that over time. And the whole message of scripture is updates, because you have Moses, then you have the prophets, then you have the New Testament, you have the histories being added in. So if, if God says, you know what, we need to look at Genesis, I want to add, make, I, I think, one more verse there for clarification, one more there, you know, that, that, that's God's prerogative, and there's nothing wrong with that. We see it throughout Israel's history. Next question over here. We talked about suffering today. Can you give a solid definition of what is evil? Can you define evil? I mean, I can go again. Uh, so I follow St. Augustine on this, that evil is a privation. So it's like cold. There's no such thing as cold. It's just the absence of heat. There's no such thing as light. It's just the absence of darkness. So evil is rejecting God. So, yeah, there's no such thing as darkness, there's just light. It's rejecting God. It's basically, as the Bible says, missing the mark, sin, so we're not living up to the way God wants us to live. Evil is putting ourselves for the things of God, the things of goodness, that kind of stuff. Uh, so I would say that evil is just the lack of good. You reject love, you reject moral righteousness, uh, you reject virtue, and you instead focus inward. See, this is the thing about pride. Pride makes us go inward. God wants us to look outward more towards other people. So sin and evil, in my view, is a lot of ways focusing more inward on yourself, going more in to your own self, a lot of ways, and not going outward. So I would say that's what happens with evil. It always starts with pride, greed, lust, you know, the seven deadly sins. Those are all inward-focused desires, and we need to be more outward-focused. Yeah, to kind of echo that, uh, I would definitely, e evil's a privation, as, as she's put it, and uh, this is where I've turned it into, and I know uh, Jones went into this earlier in his presentation, I turn it into an argument for God. It, uh, just had a debate in May in Houston, uh, you can see it on there, I have a chapter on evil and then a chapter on morality, and uh, I, I've heard more to put it this way, is that if someone is telling a lie by implication, I am implying that there is a truth from which they are deviating. So if a lie exists, then necessarily there must be a truth exists from which that lie is deviating from. I see evil much in the same way, similar to what he's saying as a privation. Evil is a deviation from some objective standard of goodness. Now, we also have to consider suffering. Um, I think that's a little bit different, but I think the sentiment's uh, there as well. Because suffice to say that, uh, look at something like diseases. So, I, you know, I've had atheists say, well, if God exists, then why would he allow this disease in X, Y, Z, or these children? Well, a disease, by definition, is a disorder of structure or function, which means that it is implying there is a dysfunction, but just like a lie implies truth, I would argue a dysfunction implies a deviation from a proper function. But if there's proper function, let me just throw out the big $5 word, then it is a deviation from some teleology, a goal, a purpose, or design plan, which means that there must have been a designer to the very thing, to the proper function that it has to begin with. All that to say, if there is suffering that implies dysfunction, and dysfunction implies proper function, and proper function implies some type of design plan, which entails a designer, what follows that in order to even call something a dysfunction, something like God must exist that... that that gave and put in a design purpose and goal for life here to begin with. So if there are dysfunctions, I would say God has to exist. 
I would just, uh, to try to put it on the bottom shelf as much as I possibly can, my perspective, not that anybody else is bound to this, I think evil is stuff God doesn't like. And when we're addressing the problem of evil, which is sometimes called the problem of pain or the problem of suffering, the pain and the suffering, that's a little bit distinct from the stuff God doesn't like. But I think when pain and suffering happens, it's because of stuff happening that God doesn't like, but he redeems it. So bad things happen because of our free choices, on my view. Bad pain, suffering, all those kind of things. But as was laid out in Jones's case, I think God redeems that because he knows that stories of great overcoming develop in us courage, which is a virtue, and things like that. So what's evil? Stuff God doesn't like. But pain and suffering may spring forth from that, but that nuance is important to keep in mind. Next question. MJ. What do y'all say to the person who says that if God really wanted people to know that he exists, he wouldn't have given us uh, such flawed evidence uh, 2,000 years ago? Why not give people a revelation like right here now where they can know with some type of certainty that he exists? Before anyone answers, can I say that I think Michael Jones should answer this? And the reason I think so is because he has dealt with what is called divine hiddenness on a number of occasions and with one of the biggest atheist voices out there, an atheist YouTuber that he deals with. So I think you should answer it. I've decreed. <laughs> so yeah, we're dealing with the issue of divine hiddenness. Why doesn't he just go up and prove it? I did a video a few months ago called why Jesus hasn't returned yet, and I just ask a simple explanation. What if Jesus descended from the sky now? Do you think the world governments are going to disband? China going to pack up, go home? The U European Union going to stop? No. People are going to use, think, well, how can we use this for our own power? How can we make him fit into our system? Maybe he can be like a ceremonial king, but we're not really going to submit to him because... When God came the first time, we got a couple groups. One group wanted to force him to be king. Another group wanted to kill him. Some wanted to get rid of him. Some wanted to use him for whatever selfish desires they have. Okay. We often want to use God for what we want. We don't want to serve God. So, you know, Pascal an early philosopher, said there's enough evidence for anyone who wants to truly follow God, and it doesn't force upon us. It's, there's enough there, I would say. Now, when you basically say, I want a divine revelation to fall from the sky to show me you're true, who's really God in this situation? You or the Creator? Well, you're putting demands on Him. You need to do something for me if you want to be, me to be on your team. Well, God doesn't need any of us. We need Him. It's, it's, people have this backwards the other way around. I actually saw recently an atheist on Twitter say, any God that exists it would, and be worthy of my respect would prove him to me. I'm like, wait a minute, who says God needs your respect? Like, that's not how this works. God has made a path for us to follow him, and anybody who is truly seeking, he will make a path known. But so often we have these selfish desires, these inclinations, that somehow God has to sort of like, show up and prove himself to me. And this always comes from a place of selfishness. So C.S. Lewis wrote a great book called Until We Have Faces. And basically in the book he just points out we can't see God yet because if he was before us, we would treat him like a magical butler in the sky. Anytime we needed something, okay, God, show up and fix it. You know, I do a lot of online apologetics, and I get people that email me for questions. I used to be like, all right, I'll answer the question, yeah. And then a day later, he'd email me again. All right, now I got another question. Answer it for me. Yeah, yeah, okay, I'll answer it. Several weeks later, I realized I wasn't helping them. They just, they turned me into their secretary. Anytime they had a problem, let me just go run to him. He'll solve it for me. They weren't learning to be critical thinkers. Again, as I t said in my talk earlier, God wants you to develop a character, become more virtuous, grow as a person. If he just showed up anytime you demand it, you're going to get spoiled you're going to demand stuff you don't need. You're just going to be expecting him 
solve all your problems. We don't live in an episode of Touched by, Touched by an Angel. We live in the real world. So we need to recognize that, and God is trying to build stuff. And as C.S. Lewis says, one day when we have faces, we will see God, and he will see us, and we will live in perfect harmony. But we're not there yet, because we've not developed the type of faces that can truly look upon him, worship him for who he truly is. We have the faces now that would use him for our own selfish gain. And we need to get to that point. That's why he's going to sanctify us first. Then when we're ready, we will see him. That's a great answer. If, if I could just kind of add two cents. No. <laughs> okay, never mind. No. Go ahead. So, I, as crazy as it sounds, I remember when I was in college, uh, like sophomore, junior year, or something like that, I remember thinking to myself, you know what, actually, I'm almost perfect. I've got a couple of flaws. If I just kind of tweak a few things, yeah, I mean, I'm not out here robbing banks or, you know, doing anything like that. You are pretty great at it. Like, I'm, I'm pretty close, right? You know? Um, 14 years of marriage, however, has made it painfully obvious that I was way, way off in my assessment. <laughs> um, I've, I've come to realize that we are, are woefully, like, we're just terrible at assessing the, the, the uh, internal state of our hearts. Like, we really are. You know, the Bible says it this way, the heart of man is desperately wicked. Who can know it, right? We can easily be like that, that Apostle Peter who says, yeah, I'm going to go hard for you, God, no matter what. No matter what, Jesus, I'm riding with you. And then... 45 seconds later, he's like, you know, cussing and, and, you know, and cursing and so forth. I don't even know that dude, right? We, we can all be Peter, right? Yeah, you know, I said that to say that many times when people are, are find themselves in that mode where it's like no answer is good enough, it's not about the information. It's not about the answer. It's just the expression of their rebellious heart against God. They just happen to be rebelling, you know, intellectually, if you will, right? And so sometimes the reality is, I mean, I, I'm as much for apologetics as anybody. Sometimes it's just a matter of we got to pray for folks, man. You know, sometimes it really is God needs to do a work of humbling that person on the inside so they can free them up to, enough to, for the light of truth to, to really uh, permeate. So, yeah. I, I just want to add on this divine hiddenness thing. Um, when God sent plague, destroyed the Red Sea and destroyed the Egyptian army that was chasing the Israelites, how long was it before they started building a golden calf and saying, this let us out? <laughs> Jesus comes to earth and they put him to death. There's nothing special about our generation that God should make himself more obvious than he already has. We're not special. But if you were to ask me, I think God knows what he's doing. Um, he... After he rose from the dead, he revealed himself to groups as large as 500 people. And from there, they turned the entire Roman Empire upside down within 300 years. So God knows what he's doing. Somebody comes along and says, why doesn't God do this for me? I reject the premise of the question because God has shown up in human history and we weren't too nice to him. But also, his way is better because obviously the church has stood... For 2,000 years so far, and the gates of hell have not prevailed against it, just like Jesus said. And Jesus also said, I feel like the evidence of God is so prevalent and all around us that it's almost, I agree with the Psalter who says, the fool says in his heart God does not exist because everything is, that exists is evidence of the Creator who created it. And so, my answer to the question about that is, why doesn't God do this, that, or the other? And I'm like, Ephesians 3.10. Y'all know Ephesians 3.10 says, so that the manifold wisdom of God will be on display through the church. God has people for this, right? That's what we are to do. We are to live out that Christ in us, because we are in Christ, and display that to the world. And that is Christ in the world. We are His church. So we're the people that do that for God, and I see the activity of God in all things, and especially in the life and activity of the church. If anybody wants to watch a debate I did recently on this topic, if you just go on YouTube, type in Inspiring Philosophy, Debate, Divine Hiddenness, it'll come up. I did it on a channel called The Gospel Truth, and you can check that out if you want more. All right, next question. Oh, sorry, I didn't see anybody standing up. I guess over here. Sorry. 
did. I worked hard for this. Okay. Okay. Michael, somebody really must love you because you got another question. All shucks. Yeah. All right. I have two questions. Uh, I don't know if I can ask both. Um, can I ask both or just one? Let's do one at a time. Let's uh, see how it first goes. First one's free. Ask, ask me one now. Ask me one after. All right. And fine. Second one's five dollars. All right. Okay. For each. Okay. Pick. Okay. Oh. oh all right. Great. Can. Um, okay. Um, Braxton, can you pick one or two, please? All right. We'll go one. All right. So that was one question. That was. That was okay. So my first question was, uh, how does prayer come into play? Millions and billions of Christians and Muslims, etc., who ask God. And to heal them or family members or just for a sign, but it's to no avail. They don't get anything. A um, family member passes or they, um, they don't get a sign. Is it cruel for God to not answer or correct people's skewed understanding of him, like with Job, uh, to keep them from entering hell, um, like after deconversion? Like, assuming it's inevitable. That's I mean, a lot of this just seems like the problem of evil. I hashed out, like, why doesn't God answer prayer? I, I, I mean, if what have happened, have you seen the movie Bruce Almighty? Bruce becomes God for like a week and he answers everyone's prayers and there's chaos. Everyone gets what they want and they hate it. You know, when I was 20, if I would have gotten everything I wanted, I'd be miserable right now. I'm 38. When I was, if I was 30, I got everything I wanted, I'd be miserable. You know, sometimes we really don't know what we want. So I think sometimes God might know better when it comes to prayer. Uh, when it comes to these types of things. When it comes to hell, I would say, I just quote C.S. Lewis. I mean, he says the doors of hell are locked from the inside. All that are in hell choose it. So he says, when it comes to the doctrine of hell, it is itself a question. What are you asking God to do? To wipe out past sins and give them a fresh start? He did on Calvary. To forgive them? They don't want to be forgiven. To leave them alone? That's what hell is. There are only two kinds of people in the end. Those who say to God, thy will be done. Those to whom God says in the end, thy will be done. All that are in hell choose it. Without that self-choice, there would be no hell. So, at the end of the day, people that are in hell have gone there because they reject God. It's Milton Fried, as um, I forget who it was, but it's um, John Milton said this in his, in his uh, poem. Satan is rejoicing. He said, it's better to reign in hell than to serve in heaven. And that is the cry that is echoing throughout the, the halls of hell right now. They, they, they don't want to submit, and they never will. They're on their empires of dirt, to quote Johnny Cash, as they sit in hell. Yeah, I think sometimes there's a, there's a lot of, some of these objections come from false theological expectations. So uh, this is where I also implement, no surprise, the lazy approach, so to speak, to where I have people say, well, if God exists, why doesn't fill in the blank? Why doesn't he stop this? Why doesn't he amputees? Why he doesn't? And rather than answer the question directly, again, I'm going to question the question. I say, well, let me see if I understand you. Are you implying that if Christianity is true, no one would ever suffer? Or are you implying that if Christianity is true, there would be no, uh, no sickness? Are you implying that if Christianity is true, he should answer every prayer in the affirmative? The answer to all of those biblically is no. If anything, if Christianity is true, we should expect persecution, we should expect disease, we should expect pain, we should expect suffering. They're going to hate you because they hated me first. And yet the question is posed as if, if Christianity were true, none of it should happen. Have you not read scripture? So sometimes it's, it's as simple for me sometimes as pointing out the fact that you do realize that your very question hinges on an assumption that is not even biblical to begin with. And I think God does answer every prayer, and I think sometimes that answer is no. Country song about that. Isn't that? I don't think there's any country fans fans here, Tim. I mean, <laughs> no country fans in Texas. Yeah. If you want to ask the next question, maybe we we'll go back in line. Let me go over here. Some of you guys can come over here too if you want. Oh, that's a line. Yeah, you, you guys get closer to the mic because I don't know if you're. I can't tell if you're sitting down or. Yeah, you're or if on you that just. Question. Sorry. First off, I wanted to thank all of you for coming and everyone who set this up. Um, my question um, hinges. I, I guess it would help to think, you know, what got you all interested in apologetics? Because my question is, how do we, 
how do we encourage apologetic thinking in an environment that does not encourage these types of discussions? So for background, I grew up in apologetics, you know, starting in high school, and that high school was very competitive. The only thing anyone wanted to care about was, you know, how do we get into the Ivy League schools with these good grades from AP classes? Um, perhaps some of you can provide some insight into, you know, uh, how you could communicate, you know, that these discussions actually matter, right? So that is my question. If you're talking, are you talking about among Christians, getting them more interested in apologetics? Because I think both Christians and non-Christians, yeah. Like both, getting non-Christians interested in having worldview discussions? Yeah. Yeah. Well, with Christians, what I would say, since they're the ones who should naturally have a desire to do that or should recognize a desire, I should say, to do that, my story was I, uh, I, I had a friend who got who began to experience same-sex attraction, and that led to a degradation of his faith where he had to decide whether to accept a biblical worldview or, or his same-sex lifestyle. And in his case, he accepted the same-sex lifestyle and ditched the Bible. And he began to challenge my views, and it rattled me, not in the sense that, I did, that, I, that it rattled my faith, it rattled me in the sense that I wanted to give an answer I didn't know how to give. And everything I've done after that in terms of apologetics has ultimately been in an effort to try and reach him and people like him. And so when, when, I, when I think about, like I said a while ago in, in my talk here, when, when I've seen people get really passionate out of nowhere, like all of a sudden they get passionate about apologetics, it's usually because as a Christian there's someone they care about who has recently become a part of some other religion or has walked away from Christianity or has become... Um, kind of progress, you know, a progressive Christian that would reject a lot of what the Bible says, and as a result, they get all fired up because now I've got a reason, and uh, that can happen with senior adults, like it happened to this conference with a lady who signed up for our pro apologetics programs because of her grandson, but it can also happen with teenagers um, who who have a friend, like I did. Now, in terms of unbelievers, uh, how do you get them interested in it? I, I think like what, one of the things we've been talking about here a little bit, dancing around it, is um, how to, someone asked, how do you start conversations with people and all that sort of thing? Almost any subject, G.K. Chesterton said, any subject that you talk about for more than five minutes, it's gonna, there's a way to get it back to God. It naturally will ultimately bring you, if you talk about something long enough, back to God. Movies are a great example of this. You just saw a movie. Uh, how does that movie make a beeline back to God? Ultimately, well, there was a movie several years ago called The Adjustment Bureau with Matt Damon. It was all about free will. Well, we heard from Tim Stratton that free will is a great way to, to move into talking about what accounts for that and, and that sort of thing. Uh, you know, things like that. I, I think it's a good practice. I do this when you're reading a book, when you're hearing about some political thing, when you're watching a movie, when you're listening to a song, when you're just having a conversation, when you're looking at a broke down car. Try to think as an experiment for yourself in your own head. If I was talking to someone else right now, how would I maybe naturally talk about this in a way that brings it back to God? And I think that's a good practice. I think what you'll ultimately find out is that uh, the people in your lives that are unbelievers who don't think those big questions are important, ultimately you can show them that whether they're a Christian or not, those questions are big, important questions that way. And that's kind of how I do it. Just whatever we're doing in life, let's just talk about what I think. We'll listen to what you think about it. Here's what I think about it. That makes me wonder. The, you know, the matrix makes me wonder, man, well, what if we were all in a matrix, you know? Uh, so you could do this with a lot of different things. And I think just constantly as a Christian thinking about and especially as parents, I should say, I, it is common, and I'm an uncool dad for this, but my girls know it. We're watching something, and there's some cultural message in there that is anti-Christian. We're going to pause it, and Dad's going to make a lecture all of a sudden. Okay. And it's going to be horrible, or maybe I'll wait afterwards, but I want my kids to think critically like that. So even with your kids, but any, even with people your own age as a teenager, think about the things in your life, the, the, what the ceiling's made out of, this carpet here, the guy at the microphone, whatever. Cowboys themselves. <laughs> talk about all these things. Anything you talk about long enough will get you back to God. And I think that's, uh, that. I just try to be open to that and look for that. Yeah, I want to add to that if I could. I think uh, one of the biggest um, problems with helping Christians to understand why politics is important 
is because it's kind of like, um, I don't know if you remember back in high school, maybe some of you are still in high school, but high school was a little ways back for me. Um, sometimes you had those electives, right, that weren't necessarily like a core class, and maybe you were just taking it to get enough credits to pass or something like that, you know. Um, if you were in a situation like that, you probably didn't put as much effort into that elective that you didn't care about as you did your core classes that you actually needed in the past. I think sometimes when it comes to apologetics, Christians treat apologetics as if it's one of those electives that's for those extra heady philosopher, you know, brainy Christians over there, but it really doesn't relate to the core uh, lifestyle of what it means to be a Christian. It's just kind of on this philosophical island out somewhere in the, in the middle of nowhere, and I don't really have to care about it. So I think sometimes what we have to do is to help people to understand that actually apologetics is not this thing that's way off over there. It actually is a part of how you live out being a Christian. When Jesus says to love God with all your, with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength, you know, he was serious about that. He really wants you to love him with all of your mind. You can't love God with all of your mind and allow for the decep for deception to take a residence in your mind, mm -hmm. right? So apologetics is a tool by which you can exercise that love for God in, in all your mind and, and get rid of deception and, you know, immerse yourself in his truth. The other piece is, we talked about this in, in my session earlier, but Matthew chapter uh, 28, the Great Commission. Um, that's not just for some people, for some Christians. That's for all Christians, right? We're all supposed to be in, uh, about the business of making disciples, right? And so the question is, are you an active an effective disciple maker or are you an inactive and ineffective when it comes to disciple making? You know, regardless of where you sit with that, the command, the Great Commission is still there sitting before each of us. And so, again, when it comes to evangelism, making disciples, when it comes to loving God with all your mind, um, that's not something that's way off in the philosophical distance somewhere. You know, like nobody would ever ask the question like, hey, how do we get Christians, Christian men to be interested in, in being faithful to their wives? I mean, maybe some people are asking that question, but it, it should sound pretty silly, right? That, that's that's when we understand that's part of what it means to be a Christian. Likewise, it should be that um, simple, you know, when it comes to answering the question of why should a Christian be interested in apologetics? It's a part of the Christian life to love God with your mind and to serve other people by making disciples uh, with the truth of the gospel. Question over here. Hello. So it's an open panel question, so anybody who wants to chime in, it's more than welcome. Uh, something I've been struggling with uh, reconciling over the past months has been the idea of the omnipotence of God tied up to the sense of self-restraint, as some, some authors you know, propose that uh, God doesn't unleash all his wrath upon his people you know, when they act up or whatever. So I have I have found it really difficult to reconcile those two concepts. You know, he's able to do anything he wants, yet there's a sense of self-restraint, like something ties him up. You know, so if anybody can chime in on that, that'd be great. You know? Are you asking the question? God is omnipotent, so obviously he could step in at any moment. Mm -hmm. And I would expect you to say there something like, "Well, then why doesn't he stop suffering?" But you said. Why doesn't he, are you saying why doesn't he judge? No, not, not why does he judge. You know, just the concept of self-restraint, like he could unleash all his wrath, you know. Us out. And why does, yeah. Exactly, why yeah. Doesn't he yeah, you got, you got my idea. Thank you. You yeah, know, he's also omnibenevolent. He's perfect in love. Okay. So, I, so in my book, I, I spend a significant portion of it talking about uh, God's, what I call his omni-attributes. Um, God's omnipotence, perfect in power, omniscience, he's necessarily uh, perfect in knowledge, and then his omnibenevolence, he's perfect in love. And so you have to find a view that makes sense of all of those. And we would also in include wrath and uh, every other attribute that he's got. You've got to find a view that makes sense of all of those, and I try to discuss in my book. Well, that makes sense. I'll get your book. In the, <laughs> in the Psalms, yeah, the short answer is God loves you. Yeah. Yeah. God loves even those who hate him. Mm -hmm. And for those, so he also knows, because he's omniscient, who will, who would and will come to know him in the future, and who will repent, and who will ultimately accept his love and forgiveness. And so why would he annihilate them when he knows they're eventually, and maybe they're not going to, but their grandkids are. Mm. So of course he's not going to annihilate them. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I was going to say in the Psalms, that question is asked throughout, especially in the imprecatory Psalms. Yeah. To where they, they actually accuse God, wake up, O sleeper, where are you? 
right? Because they're crying out for justice. So the Bible itself has this tension that goes back to the love and mercy of God versus the unleashing of his wrath. The thing that I take comfort in him not unleashing all of his wrath is because he could unleash that on me too, because even though I'm a child of God, I still sin. Thank God he doesn't unleash all that wrath. So when I get irritated, and that I'm, that's I'm mild language, about our enemies that we are supposed to love, God, why are you not bringing that thunder down on their head? Oh, because he didn't on my head either. And so that's how I, I think, and I think that's the, the, the reconciliation of that, is why, why, should I, I mean, why should God not unleash the fullness of his wrath on the sin I want him to judge instead of the sin that I have in my own life? And that's where you resolve the tension. I would add to that just a little bit. Um, I think, in part, the answer to your question is God is beautiful. Right. Um, when you think about art, generally speaking, uh, we often have an appreciation for things that are symmetric, you know, when there's a balance, you know, in the picture, if you will. Right. Um, if you're doing theology right, and I would defer to the, the heavy header theologians, <laughs> correct me if I'm wrong, but um, if you're doing theology right, then you should come to a picture of God where you see a symmetry between things like his justice and his mercy. That's what we see at the cross. Like, Justice was poured out on the cross. And it was also mercy that was poured out on the cross. Like we see this beautiful symmetry. And so you run into a problem in the text when your picture of God is top heavy, favoring one of his attributes more so than another, to where it creates an imbalanced picture of who he is. So sometimes there are certain theologies that emphasize his power and sovereignty and so forth, maybe to the undermining of other aspects of his of his uh, nature, you know, omniscience and so on and so forth, right? The bottom line is we want to be looking for that, that divine symmetry, that beauty um, that's, that's available there in the text. And so I think when you do that, you find that um, his restraint, you know, like in, in reference to your question, it's actually probably um, an expression of this other virtue that's present there in the text, you know, in a given situation. And we can appreciate that beauty. Does that make sense? It does. And thank you all. You were great on the answer. <laughs> all right. Next question over here. Well, uh, first of all, thank you all for coming. It's been a pleasure to be able to get to one of these, finally. Um, um, my, my question is initially for Mike, but anyone else, feel free to chime in. You mentioned in your... Uh, yeah, I know, you again. Um, it's his show. Um, <laughs> the, in, in, your present, your, in your presentation, you briefly talked about a, um, Adam being our representative and mm -hmm. that we, we fell in, in him. And it reminded me of a, of a doctrine that some Christian theologians hold, but not everyone, of the federal headship of Adam, where um, when, he, when, he, when he fell, we fell too in the sense that we're also guilty of Adam's sin because he is our representative. My question is, do you hold to the federal headship of Adam? And how do you square that with, with passages like, say, Ezekiel, I believe it's 18, where it mentions that we're not held accountable for the sins of our parents or grandparents, and others, feel free to chime in to, like, to hear perspective. Yeah, I need to look at the passage to know exactly what you're talking about. So I don't think I can comment on that right now, because I, I think we need to take me a little while to do a proper exegesis of the text. Uh, but when it comes to headship, this is very common in the, in the world of the ancient Near East. And it's something that we in the hyper-individualistic culture today just do not get. It's, we're, they were very collective. We're very individual. And there's probably a good medium somewhere we got to meet find in the middle. But the simple point is, is that we affect those around us whether we like it or not. You know, I was just reading a story about uh, a guy who decided he was now transgender and he was so sad that his wife left him. Well, of course, be, because when you enter into a marriage, you're no longer an individual. You're now part of that marriage and what you do affects your spouse whether you like it or not. And she's going to break away from that because what he's doing is affecting her in ways he can't she, he, she cannot deal with. So this was very common in the ancient Near East. They understood what, you know, what the king did was going to affect the nation. What the father did or the mother did was going to affect the children. So when it comes to the headship idea, yes, we were all in Adam uh, as our representative and we all suffered from that. But the good news is, is that we are all saved in Christ. 
So at the same time, it's not fair that we fell in Adam, but it's also not fair what we get through Christ. So it's fixed in that sort of solution kind of thing. But, but do you believe we're guilty for Adam's sin? It's, so, diff- it's different. It's one yeah. thing to say we're affected by Adam's sin, but are we guilty well, for Adam's I was just sin? about to get to that. So there's two views in the church. If you go to like the Eastern Orthodox Church, it's a little bit different than what you're going to get with St. Augustine. So St. Augustine put forward the definition of original sin based solely on his exegesis of Romans 5.12, which is that we all inherit the guilt of Adam. But the majority of the church prior to that and still in the East did not accept that view. Uh, It was the idea that we have inherited Adam's nature. Therefore, we sin. And so uh, we're responsible for our own sin, but we're not born guilty because of Adam, but we will be guilty necessarily because of our nature. And so this is an idea solely that came from St. Augustine. I tend to disagree with him. I tend to follow the, the Eastern view on this. Uh, I think that's just one thing. He's a great theologian all around, but I'm not going to agree with everything he said. So I tend to take the um, more Eastern view on that. Yeah. Um, this is a Baptist event, and I, I, I would, it would be remiss not to point out that the Baptist Faith and Message 2000 says that what we got from Adam was a nature and an environment inclined towards sin, which is cons- consistent with what Jones just said. It's consistent with what I affirm, which is I, I, I take what you just said about other passages that indicate that uh, a, a son will not be held guilty for his father's sin or the father for his son's sin. I, I think this accounts for that. What we get from Adam, and I think this still makes some sense out of federal headship just with the nuance, is that what we get from Adam is a nature and an environment that is inclined towards sin. Uh, but I don't take that we inherit a guilt nature, and the, S, and the Southern Baptist Convention's Baptist faith and message doesn't even require that for its members. But uh, so I think that makes sense of that. But then we all do sin. <laughs> And, and, and the nature and environment inclined towards sin uh, leads in that direction. So, um, yeah, that, that would be my answer. Okay, we're going to do two more questions. This one over here. This should, be, this should be brief. This is directed to Michael Jones. Uh, yeah. I want to thank you for your uh, wonderful theodicy earlier uh, concerning uh, suffering and gratuitous evil. Uh, during the end of your presentation, you had mentioned that uh, animals would be present uh, post, uh, post second coming of Jesus and then the restored heavens and earth. Uh, my question is, your uh, theodicy was a version of a soul-building theodicy, if I'm not mistaken. Yep. And with that being said, would then uh, the animal's presence in the restored heavens and earth uh, infer that, one, uh, animals a, uh, w- would have souls, Two, that the uh, soul-building theodicy would in some way or other uh, apply towards animal suffering, especially gratuitous evil. And then uh, three, uh, actually I forgot the third point, so I'm just going to leave it at that. So could you repeat the second one? Uh, The second point, would the soul-building theodicy then apply to uh, animals? animals? Yes. So we need to define soul. There's different ways. There's a platonic way to define a soul, which is like this ethereal substance that we all sort of have. Uh, Aristotelian view of soul, I think, is more consistent with scripture. And that's the idea. It's in line with the soul building, see, obviously. You get a soul the moment of conception, and that slowly builds over time. So your soul is your dreams, your emotions, your desires, your dispositions, your thoughts, your goals, all of that. So your soul is evolving and building over time. That collection of that stuff, you, that's your soul. And that's an Aristotelian understanding of a soul, more like. So that's what I would say is the soul. And yes, I would say animals have that. And so I would say they have some form of soul-building theodicy. What that looks like in the afterlife, I don't know. I ain't been there. Uh, but I would say we don't entirely know. I think, you know, if you look at J.R. Tolkien's world, there are hobbits, there are dwarves, there are birds that talk, and there are birds that, that have conversations with the dwarves and the men of, of Esgaroth the legendary city of Lake Town in the Book of the Hobbit. Sorry, I'm going off on my nerd tangent. Um, so, no, you're thinking of Dale, the northern city, where the king, yeah, yes, 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 where King Bard reigns, and then his son fights in the thing. I'm talking of Esgaroth, Lake Town, sir. Oh, Sit down. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> yes, Smog fell at Esgaroth, not Dale. I, I thought you were so. talking about Malachandra there for a moment. <laughs> so, I would say that we very well may see more intelligent animals like what Tolkien talks about in the resurrection to come. We don't ultimately know. We know God knows 
every living creature. He knows he will work triumph through them and we will see good come out of it. I don't think we're going to be having necessarily animals that are going to be come human-like. I think there's beauty in just the way they are and they, they, they will declare the glory of God in that way. My, I didn't talk about this in my talk, but my, my speculative, purely speculative view of eschatology is once we get resurrected, uh, it'll be our job to pick up where we left off in Genesis 1 when God said to subdue the, subdue the earth. There's a big universe out there. I think, and I'm speculating, but it's going to be our job as resurrected saints to turn the whole universe into Eden one planet at a time. Mm. And there's going to be a lot of room for all the animals. So, big universe. So, atheists say, there's a big universe. Why didn't God fill it with life? Well, he's gonna. What do you think we're here for? Yeah. I, I, you know, Mike, I've always thought about that. That, that seems so odd to me that people would ever, like, I think that causes some rolling of the eyes, that sort of thing. But come on, we got Elon Musk trying to get us to Mars right now. We think that God's uh, institution couldn't do better? Oh, it could, yeah, absolutely. Uh, I'll just quickly add that uh, I've been thinking about this a lot lately. And uh, I wrote an article on my website, freethinkingministries.com, um, called All Dogs Go to Heaven. And in that uh, article, I do provide a deductive argument that deductively concludes, therefore, all animals go to Dogs, heaven. just dogs. Now, it, it, is, it was focused on dogs, but I do apply it to all animals besides spiders. Those, those are demons. That makes sense. So, yeah. That no, makes I, sense. I do. It's not an argument I'm going to, I'm not going to die on that hill defending that argument, but I think it, it's, it's biblically backed and it's a logical argument. I think we at least have a reasonable hope that we can at least hope for our animals and even all animals to be in heaven. So, in the, in the new heavens and new earth. I'm there with you, buddy. Nice. Uh, yes, animals have souls. Bob talks about the fetch towards animals. The topic of the soul has been become my bread and butter topic, so much so that I drive a Kia Soul so I can make a joke when I have a presentation on the soul, which I actually have back there, another shameless plug. Uh, but there's a lot to go into when it comes to the metaphysics, but suffice to say that if something is conscious, it needs an immaterial substance to be grounded in, and I think that's what the soul is going to be. Um, the Bob talks about animals having souls. I think that when we get to heaven, there's going to be a higher level of awareness, and if animals are going to be in heaven and God redeems all creation, and if their higher level of awareness is also increased as ours, then like Joan said, I'm not going to say they become persons, but they may have some type of capacities unlocked so much so that, to quote from Trent Doherty's book, they, they, will look, uh, you know, they can look back on their lives, reflect on it, and yes, that soul-building theodicy will apply in the afterlife, and I think Doherty says, and in that embrace, their evil is defeated. So, yeah, I, I think, uh, so yes and yes is the short answer to both the questions. Right. All right, the final question over here. So forgive me as I recover from my woeful lack of Lord of the Rings. Yeah, you uh, should. I'll, I'll forgive you, though. So you opened with um, part, of, part of your opening involved theological triage and keeping the main thing the main thing, and I'm sensing the irony here as I bring this question up after my comment. Um, how, in the context of evangelism, like the actual act, how do we deal with that, say, with a non-believer who is super focused on spiritual crowns and how we earn them, or when fortunate enough to evangelize in the context of community, when doing it with a Calvinist brother who has mentioned total depravity at least 15 times, or an Arminianist brother who keeps holding out this hypothetical present and telling the person to open it? Right? How do we charitably keep the main thing the main thing when both a non-believer and a believer are trying to derail that? Tell him to shut up. No, no um, I'm kind of joking. Uh, but yeah, I think, gosh, I think Christians need a spiritual spanking. I think a lot of them really do. Uh, but I'll put it this way. There are Calvinist brothers and sisters of mine that I will gladly go evangelize with. Uh, if if I had the opportunity, if, if you said, would you rather, you know, talk theology with these people or, you know, let's say a friend of mine, and, and, I, and I won't, you know, make eye contact, but there are some friends in the crowd of mine who are here and they're Calvinists. I have some friends of mine who are here and are atheists. I have some friends of mine who are here, maybe agnostic, some who just recently call themselves a closet Christian, and I'm hoping he comes out the closet soon. So, um, what I, no one laughed at that, really? Come on, that was kind of funny, right? <clears throat> so, all that to say is... I would rather, you know, if, if I'm talking, let's su suppose Pritchett's a Calvinist, he's not, but, you know, in my mind, I'm like, hey, this guy over here is not saved. You are saved. I do disagree with you, but let's go get that guy. 
That, that's kind of my train of thought. Now, again, I think there's a place for the discussion, but my goodness, yeah, I, I think a lot of times we, we tend – we get so caught up. I can't stand the people, and maybe it's just getting late, so I'm getting more irritated you know, as you ask these questions, not with you guys, but with – yeah, thinking of these things are the kind of things that like I know of people who they study theology, they study apologetics, and what do they do with that? They get on Facebook and argue with people. Right. Yeah. Like, my goodness, get a life. Go witness. Go out and reach someone. Yeah. Uh, and, yeah. I, I, this, this is something that I harp on a lot. Um, if your love of theology and apologetics and doctrine and all of that has led you to spend more time online with other like-minded people debating this rather than getting out on the streets and talking to real people about Jesus, it seems like the people who are the most theologically informed ought to be the ones who are most passionate about evangelism. The opposite is true. The opposite, and that's, that is a shame on all people who think of themselves as we're the intellectual Christians, we're the intellectual theologian, theology-minded, apologetic-minded Christians who go to the conferences and never share the gospel with anybody. It's ridiculous. And that is the people who know better. And if all they want to do is entertain themselves and argue this and that other minor point of theology that's Calvinism versus Arminianism or whatever, and you want to do that for hours and hours and hours instead of sharing the gospel with your neighbor, you need to check your sanctification. Period. So I, I agree 100%. I'm, I'm not necessarily trying to bash any school of theology. But he always okay, sounds angry like, like that. At, at the table, at a coffee shop, witnessing to a non-believer, and my brother is there. How do I charitably steer the direction without saying, I, "Like, hey, you're an idiot. Be quiet." I, let me give you it in two minutes, and then Adam's going to go. Okay, you get right back to the gospel, and it will shut up the Christian. Because here's what here's what Tim Keller did in two minutes. He said, "You go to the person and you say, look, every worldview is going to make you prideful. If you are a religious person, you can't help but feel superior to atheists.'" And if you're a secular atheist, you can't help but feel superior to religious bigots. And what if you're just a hardworking, decent chap? You can't help but feel superior to lazy people. But the gospel says you're a moral fa failure. The gospel says you can't achieve perfection, even if you try, you'll fail. So you need a savior to come in. You know, I have known atheists who are better people than me. They do more with charity work. They've done more to try to help people. But so why would I be saying that? Am I not a Christian? Am I not supposed to feel better than them? Well, the truth is quite simple. I'm a sinner and saved by grace. So does it matter how good I am? It matters how good he was. If that's at the center of your life, that's going to equip you to change. That's going to equip you to deal with people and to see them as your equals, to see them as people who need saved just as much as you do. And it's going to be a great buffer against pride. I'm not saying Christians don't suffer from pride, but it's going to be, that's, that's the counteract. That's the medicine to pride right there. It's Christianity, because it's the only faith that it's about, we're saved by grace through faith, and it's all about what he did, not what we do to earn that salvation. That's great. Yeah, I was just kind of adding a real quick nugget, too. Like, I mean, this is not always possible, but uh, like the scripture talks about, you know, uh, how can two walk together unless they be agreed? Um, you know, as I think Eric alluded to, there are some people that I love them as my brother or sister in Christ, but if I know that I'm going somewhere with the intent to to witness or whatever, you know, th that's not where we can team up. You know, we, we see things very differently. So it's just not going to work, you know. And sometimes you have to have those conversations ahead of time. You know, you got to maybe if, if you know that you and this other person disagree to such an extent um, that it's not going to work out in terms of you guys being able to do a witnessing effort together, then that's just not what you guys can do together. Yeah, you know, I'm trying to avoid. There's a, there's an example I want to use involving you because I remember a particular instance that occurred online, but I'm trying to refrain from mentioning people by name. Uh, but I'll just use Eric as an example. I remember uh, witnessing a, uh, a gentleman, you know, who we all know, um, who spent more time coming at Eric on Facebook as Eric was trying to evangelize to another gentleman that it, it became just this really um, just nasty affair, if you will, not on Eric's part. But I noticed that in Eric, you know, his his goal was as this person was this fellow Christian. Taking, taking jabs at him, Eric was constantly trying to find common ground. You know, that in, in that particular instance, I don't think it worked out super well, you know, not, again, not because of Eric. Uh, but I think that can be another piece, too. If you find yourself in a pinch, you know, it just so happens that the conversation is struck up. Sometimes you can find some sort of theological ground and try to guide the conversation that way. Uh, but if, if you can exercise some forethought, then I think that's even better. You know, how can two uh, walk together unless they be agreed? My dad had a saying... Um 
You may not like the way that I'm doing it, but it's dang better than the way you're not doing it at all. And so I kind of stick with that. And if two Christians are out trying to evangelize and they're so different in theology that they are going to ignore the people that need to be evangelized to start arguing, you can't say that. You did not try to lead them in a sinner's prayer. I don't like that. And someone else says, yeah, but you, did, you don't give them any opportunity at all. You say, well, you're Calvinist. Tell them, well, repent if God makes you, but if not, hope for the best, right? If you get into that kind of bickering in front of lost people, that, that's where I agree with that. Part ways, don't do this together because y'all are not mature enough to keep the main thing the main thing. And so this requires a little bit of maturity, and it's about time we start telling Christians to grow up if they cannot be mature and keep the main thing the main thing. Yeah, yeah let's uh, give it a hand for all our speakers. Thank you guys for coming.